on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. I was kind of a minor celebrity on set. It was kind of amazing. And nobody knows who you are because unlike the stars, you don't usually have a recognizable face. So there's usually this moment where you kind of get to know them and then and then somebody says something and their face changes. It's like, oh, you wrote the books that we're all working on essentially. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Do you know, I hesitated for a second then because I've, um, I've been playing around. Mm. As a... Okay. Well, I've been t- I've been uh, cheating on this podcast by co-hosting another podcast in oh. the self-publishing space. Right. Okay. And I almost said, "Welcome to the self the Selmore Book Show," because that's ah. what I was thinking about. But uh, I didn't because I know which podcast I'm on, and I, you know, I'm back in the room. Good. I want you. I want. I want everyone to know I've got their foot. You know, they have my full attention. This is COVID messing with your brain. Probably is. Yeah. So I I sat in um, with. Brian Cohen on the Selmore Book Show this week, and uh, uh, we had a fun time actually. So you know he does these news items. He's always done them back in the day with Jim Cockrell, long ago. I hadn't realised been going for eight years that show. Been very well. Eight years. Um, eight yeah. years. So he says eight years. Yeah. What he said long, to me, unless he's us. making stuff up. But you know, I think he's telling the truth. Longer than us. Um. Mm. Okay. Um, that, I mean, that one with, when he was doing it with Jim, that was a long time ago. I do remember. It was. It was. Well, maybe. Maybe that's that's right. Anyway, it's four hundred and sixteen episodes, something like that. Oh wow. Um, okay. And uh, yes, he has uh, he has his news section at the beginning, and we have our banter section at the beginning. We slightly do. slightly less formal, but nonetheless, we do talk about important things. Now, I'm I want to talk about something, and I. <clears throat> I'm slightly wary about uh, seeking advice on this because you get so many opinions in the end, you don't know what to do with all the opinions. And I think you have to trust your instinct on this. But um, I think I told you, I don't know if I told you that um, John Major lives up the road from the XPM and I, he read my book. He was very kind about it. And I, I've i taken a year to do this because I thought when I first wrote my book and published it, I had no idea whether it was completely rubbish. And I don't want to drag, sully his standing and his branding with my if i asked him to do a favor like you know giving me a cover quote so i've left it a year but i've had enough feedback now in the book enough lovely letters from from people um who were in the RAF in the 60s and and lots of reviews on amazon that i felt confident to say okay this book's not terrible john you liked it would you mind giving a cover quote so he's very kindly very enthusiastically given me uh, some quotes to go on the front cover of the book or the back cover and in the marketing and so on which is superb but i had a chat with him on the phone and he asked a lot of questions about my next book, set wholly in America with American characters. And he actually said at one point, I hope it's not going to be in the US English. Oh, right. And I said, well, actually it is because it's wholly set in America with completely American characters. And I know I'm a British author, but I, I felt it should be, but it's really played on my mind. Oh, and we've I, talk, haven't we talked about, spoken about this before? We have spoken about it before, but I think I'm about to flip so not, what, not flip out. So <laughs> at the moment, are you spelling in American? I am spelling in American. Yeah, that's not a good idea. That's what that's John Major thinks. He is right. Um, what, what, well, in my opinion, this is what I would do. And what I do do is I spell in the Queen's English. So colour has a U, etc. And I, if my characters are American, they would not refer in dialogue or in, in their kind of written thought. They wouldn't refer to a car park. They'd refer to a parking lot. Yeah. They would refer to a sidewalk rather than a pavement. So it's a kind of compromise between the two because you are, at the end of the day, you're, you're English. Yeah. As the author is English. I think the author should spell in the language that is local to him. But I think the characters can and should refer to things in the lang- in, 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 by way of the terms that they would understand. Yes, that, that's a given. And the vernacular for, for speech and, and, and even description, you know, it's going to, because I'm always, it's always a POV of an American character. So it's going to be a parking lot and, um, and a store, not a shop and so on. 
that's a given for me. It really is just about the spelling. And, you know, I guess in the old days, I guess when Ian Fleming wrote James Bond, they, they had a print version for America and a print version for the UK, and they probably well, did different spellings. We, we for actually, for the cleaner, um, the uh, the two editions, the American edition has been Americanized. So yeah. it does, it is spelt in, um, so color would have no U. Um, but... It's difficult to do that on Amazon because you have the one ace in. Um, So I wouldn't recommend having an American edition and a UK edition. That's just complicated. Um, And uh, potentially also, I think that might be in breach of terms of service because you could end up getting it's two aces and someone could buy it twice. Um, Yeah. No, it would have to be something I think Amazon introduced as an option, which they could do. I I mean, for me, I think you'll get a lot of feet, a lot of flack, uh, pun intended, if Mm. you, from your English readers, and that'll be mostly English readers at the moment, Mm. because you write about the RAF and Vulcans and things. Well, you'll have some US, I I bet you, if you looked at your numbers, you'll find a big skew in favour of the UK. If you suddenly start spelling in in American, you'll get you'll get definite complaints, and I yes. think it'll hit you in the reviews. But when I don't think you'll get that if 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 you write in English English, and I don't think Americans will complain because they will, I suspect they will by that stage know that you're not American. Yes, I I, I very rarely, almost never get complaints from Americans saying they've spelt color incorrectly. Okay, I I did get a lot of complaints from English people saying stop writing in American. Yes, that's what I felt I was going to get. And I think my particular audience who do notice that I landed an Anson on its nose wheel and an Anson doesn't have a nose wheel. They are the sort of readers and I love them for it, who will pick up on things and will will mm-hmm. say will say you, to me you'll definitely get bad reviews i think <clears throat> yeah. yeah yes okay well that's that decision mate so i've only got seven it's, luckily it's only seventy one thousand words this novel not 135 yeah. like last time and so i can i can go through and i do have an american proof editor which is still important for me regardless of the spelling he'll, he'll be happy i know he does u.s english as US, u.s and uk english he'll be happy with that decision and he is there primarily for all the other things for the vernacular for car types uh, and just uh, i think probably what i'm hoping to get from leighton wingate it sounds like a great name is is we wouldn't you know an american wouldn't say that to his friend you know the sort of thing i just simply wouldn't know because i've been born and brought up there yeah, yeah. so i'm look, looking forward to that getting that from um, from leighton wingate which uh, my other editor andrew says sounds like a chris morris character from that's a very it's a comedy really series in the UK. A much more uh, British centric reference, could you? That's- I have to apologise. This is the most I've spoken for a bit. I've had COVID and I'm completely over it. Feel completely back to normal, but I've just got this lingering, slight tickly cough, which I think happens a lot. Uh, this, so sorry I, sh- if I, I should also apologise. There are people here in the background. Lucy's wrapping something at the moment very loudly, mm. um, so I think there's bubble wrap being unwrapped or something like that. So someone's someone's birthday coming up. No, no it's Halloween, selling, isn't it? She's selling a saddle. So, um, so, oh God, that's a heavy thing to wrap, isn't it? Uh, yes, <laughs> it's quite heavy, yeah. Blimey. Um, okay, good. Well, that's that's that decided then. So uh, thank you for your opinion, if you're, if you're shouting at the uh, podcast right now, but I, th- I suspect most people would agree with that. So we'll go with um, UK English for spelling. And at the moment, the manuscript is in US English, so it's been slightly annoying having to write realise. Obviously, I switched word over, so I didn't flag mm. it. I have to switch word back. Um, good. So I've put my book on pre-order, my second novel. Um, I did make a slight error, I think, yesterday, and this is just something to think about. First of all, I don't email my list very often, um, and I've emailed them two emails quite quickly together within a week. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, and the second email was uh, the announced the winner of a competition. And I think a combination of two emails in quick succession and the words winner and competition in the subject line and in the, has meant that I've got a lower open rate on that probably in a few spam for one person at least a regular has emailed me to say it was in their spam folder unusually right um so it's just the sort of thing you have to think about if it's in a bigger it's a big announcement like a pre-order that you want to get some reaction from just make the email about that i think is probably good advice um uh, in actual fact uh the open rates are very good i get 65 percent on average on my yeah that's excellent my emails but this one's 53 at the moment so it's still down. still fine Still fine, yes. And uh, I shall just sit back and watch the millions rolling in now. 
um, on my way. And I have decided I think I'm going to do a novella next. I think it's time now I can breathe a little bit, have my two full-length novels out there, add a novella, which will become a mailing list builder, such an important thing to build that mailing list, mm. build it faster than it's building at the moment. And also, I think I, I, from a writing point of view, having done two full-length novels in a row, I'm looking forward oh, to... Oh, you poor baby. Looking forward to um, writing a <laughs> 25,000 word story uh, about military aviation. So, you know, get the world's smallest violin out. That, that's um, you've written two novels in a row over the course of what t- ten years, and now you want to write a novella. You, you, where's your stamina? I don't, it's don't supposed know. to be supportive. Well, I've done my best. But, uh, yeah. there, there, comes, there comes a time when I have to pull you up, and um, that's uh, no. I think that's not a bad idea actually to kind of just clear your throat a little bit. So, you know, again, pun, pun intended. Um, and and yeah, just just get something that you can then use as a as a magnet in the end of your novels and also um, on Facebook and things like that. That would be quite good. So, yes, good idea. Yes, I shall do that. Right. We have a special guest today, Johnny B. Truant. Great name. Great guy. Um, many of you will know uh, Johnny because from the early days of podcasting and self-publishing, he was one of the three kings of Austin. Um, so, well, weren't uh, in Austin at the time. Oh, uh, no. Where were they at the time? Well, I don't think they were in Austin at all. He was in Cincinnati, I think. Uh, Dave was in Florida and Sean was hmm, San Diego. But yes. Um, they, I do I mean, remember I, them. I remember I think, the split screen when they started doing mm, video. The three I of think them. only, uh, I think Sean and Johnny, had, and it might be in Austin now. Um, but Dave, as far as I know, is still in Florida. I don't mm. I think they've given up trying to move Dave. He, he's somewhere. Yes. He hasn't even told anyone where he lives. He's in the, ba- in the basement. It doesn't matter where he is. He doesn't emerge above ground no. anyway. So um, <laughs> I've never met Dave to this day. I've never met Dave. Oh, well, there you go. Um, well, I was asked this week actually by Brian Cohen. He's, you know, he said, what well, we were talking about defining success. And I said, you know, at some people it's going to be seeing their book in a in a big bookshop or in the front of the window, something like that. And I have to say, for me, it would, the dream always would be it being turned into a TV series or a film. You know, visiting the sets of people interpreting a story that you'd created, characters you'd created in their own way would be just, I think, the most amazing experience. Mm. And our guest today, Johnny B. Truant, has just had that experience. He's just been to Canada and been on the set of Reginald the Vampire, a series uh, on sci-fi... Sci-fi, I think, coming sci-fi. up. Sci-fi, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, no announced release date as it stands at the moment. But this is an adaptation of one of his early series, actually, Fat Vampire. Um, do you, have you read any of the Fat Vampire books? I haven't, but I'm, I'm, I know. Obviously, I, I used to listen to their podcast a lot in the early days, so I know, I know that Johnny wrote that, and and I've no, I, I knew that he's had it made. So that's that's there aren't that many um, authors that I can think of. I mean, uh, Wool with um, yes, of course, Hugh Harry. Well, that that has that has entered production now. So I know I've seen pictures of him on set. So that's certainly being made. Um, so Johnny, that's another one. There, I can think of maybe four or five maximum who've actually got to the stage of not just well, having in, it. indie authors. Yeah, mm, yeah. I mean, I mean, Andy Weir famously. Of Andy course. Weir, he, yeah. yes, certainly. And um, I mean, you could say um, uh, Fifty Shades. I don't remember her name now. Uh, A. L. James. E. L. James. Yeah. So that, I mean, technically, that would also have been at, at the start self-published, and yeah. Not subsequently, so there, there have been a few, but definitely not many. No. And um, in the trad world, it's more. I mean, I'm reading. I follow Neil Gaiman actually on Twitter at the moment. I think mm. he's quite invested in the latest adaptation mm. of his books. So, okay. Well, let, let's listen to Johnny B. Trent. Now, if you're wide uh, or exclusive. Well, you will be one of those two things if you're published. Um, there's quite an interesting little bit about uh, getting visibility for your book that Johnny has a theory on in this interview. So I'll tease that and uh, hand you over to, uh, to Johnny B. Truett. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Johnny B. Truett, welcome back to The Self-Publishing Show. What a delight to have you back here. It's always fun to come back. I, I did Joanna Penn's show recently, too, and I hadn't talked to her in a long time. So it's so fun to uh, revisit some old friends. Yeah, it's really cool. And it's been uh, it's been quite a while since we've sort of been in the same room for various reasons. And uh, I should say, I, I'll forget to re- I'll forget to introduce it. I've just been for a run, which is why I look terrible. Although <laughs> I have noticed I'm in sort of Ukrainian colors, aren't I, by accident, which is 
a nice thing to support. Sure, there you go. There you go. That was totally intentional, I'm sure. Totally intentional. Yeah, blue background, <laughs> yellow t-shirt. So yeah. Uh, okay, look, let's crack on with this and leave uh, leave that side of things out of it for the moment. Um, Johnny, let us catch up with uh, with what's been happening in your life. I think the last time you and I spoke was probably on your podcast where you did a kind of state of the industry series, which was really good. Um, but Sterling and Stone and you and the guys, not everybody will be familiar with with who you are, the legends that you are in the indie <laughs> community. So why don't you give us the kind of skinny on your uh, your recent past? Well, I think the last time we talked to you, we were doing a lot more. We were kind of split between two major things. So we were doing our own uh, fiction writing. We were doing our own storytelling and book publishing. But then at the same time, we were also teaching like you guys are doing, but you do it so much better. <laughs> It was always something that um, we enjoyed doing, but um, it was never we were never as pro at it or as as good at it as you guys were. Um, we have since moved out of um, a lot of that and are now just telling stories, which I think is the reason a lot of that our paths haven't crossed much. Uh, we have sort of. We still have our books that are still technically out there for sale, but we haven't been doing any of our uh, meetups or instructional summits, writing more nonfiction, any of that. And so we're storytellers now and with specifically an aim toward um, the the audiovisual side. So we weren't doing that either. So we've traded off our our education and moved into um, video selling stuff to Hollywood, essentially. Yeah, sort of. Um adaptation which i think is a really good area for us to talk about not just well right, right from the beginning i'm interested to talk to you about whether you write books from the beginning with that in mind and then how you move it on and, and get a deal and so on and we'll talk about that i just just dwell for a second you've done so many different things <laughs> you were the first podcast i used to listen to uh, on indie publishing and wouldn't miss it every week sort of felt you, you gave the whole indie community a sense of community i think uh, you guys which was which was really great um we spoke for a while. You had your story engine idea, which I was quite excited about because it was just like nothing else that anybody had tried, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a very you kind of project to just let's let's do this, let's try and try and get this going. Where you would have the kind of bare bones of a plot and take some of the grunt out of the difficult hurdles to get going on writing a book and present somebody with a package where they could sit back and enjoy the mm -hmm. writing. Is that still going, or was it run its course or? No, that uh, that wasn't. I mean, we've taken a lot of shots. And um, when I say we, I mean, largely Sean. Um, I would <laughs> left my own devices. I would just tell stories. <laughs> Sean likes to uh, push the boundaries and some of them work and some of them don't. So I think that was a really good idea that it never really found its legs. Um, we did one major push and there were some other that people got into kind of along the way. Um, but after that, it was like it just wasn't really sustainable. Um, but the people who did it seemed to enjoy it. Uh, but no, we aren't. We aren't still. It was called Stories to Go is the, was the name of that. Go, yeah. And we aren't yeah. we aren't really doing that anymore. Yeah. So I think it's probably a book, wasn't it? So but you've done your 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 books. I've got one of them here, which I read a couple of years ago. Um, <clears throat> and more recently, then, as you say, for you, back to the writing. I mean, you've always been writing. You've got mm -hmm. a hundred odd books. I think I read somewhere to your name. Yeah, I think uh, I've been using that figure of 100 because I knew it was almost 100 for a while. And now I'm using around 100. I don't it depends on how you count it. But yes, I would say I've written around 100 books. And in terms of genre, Johnny, how much have you changed over time? Um, we've always been when I say we. So just for anybody who doesn't know, I have written a, a few books on my own. But most of what I write is with is co-written with Sean Platt. And so we have been multi-genre almost from the beginning. It was one of the things that we kind of put our stakes in the sand from the start. Our first together project was called Unicorn Western, which was this gonzo fantasy Western. And the second thing was The Beam, which was hard sci-fi. So um, we do specialize in sci-fi. We have more sci-fi than anything else. Uh, Fat Vampire is comedy horror. Um, but we've written uh, literature and steampunk and a little bit of fantasy and thrillers. And so we we kind of round the bases. So the only one I haven't heard there is romance. You've never attempted. Uh, we have just not under our own names. We were okay. not good romance authors. Just saying. I don't believe that. OK, <laughs> right. Well, let's talk about um, adaptation, then, which I know is something you have been gearing yourselves towards in the last couple of years. So. Uh, we'll talk about Fat Vampire, but when you start writing books today or in the last last 24 months or so, are you writing them from the beginning thinking this is I need to write this in a way that I can pitch it later? 
Well, I'm gonna, you're going to get a uh, middle of the process answer from me. And I would suggest just as a first glance on this, that if you're really interested in learning about adaptation for the listeners, you should have Sean back on because Sean has done a lot of that and knows a lot more than I do. Um, it's something that I've just kind of started to try to get into. And famously in um, Hollywood circles, writers, uh, authors, prose authors make bad script writers. That's just kind of something that they all believe. And the reason is because prose writing and uh, screenwriting are so different and they're using different sk skill sets and y you don't have that that ability to go deep into a character's head and motivations and explain things in script. So it's very different. Um, to answer your question, we have had that in mind for a few projects, but it's very quickly forgotten. So what, what I mean is this will be something that will be put on a, a, a film at some point it's going to be sold we there's one in particular that i'm thinking of that i don't know if i'm allowed to mention names but it was just this real quick buzzy sort of story like an action paced thing that we we intentionally kept it short so that it would be more easily adaptable we kept it with a single point of view which tends to make a clearer single storyline which is one of the things that becomes cumbersome in adaptations is trying to do too much at once um, just as a side thought my favorite example of this is anybody who's seen that second Fantastic Beasts movie, um, she's writing that like a novelist, like she's trying to t do 20 different storylines at the same time. And as a result, it's kind of a mess, whereas successful stories that are adapted for film are usually one main thoroughfare that have a few sort of entry points and stuff. Um, so we have kind of kept that in mind. But once we get into the creative process, I forget about it and i just um i just tell the story and the, the the book is always um in some way meant to be the inspiration for the 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 translation to another form but sometimes it's translated a lot and sometimes it's a, a small transformation but i'm still learning that we've done it as a studio uh, meaning that i haven't been involved in some of those that they've done a lot of script adaptations and that sort of thing just for features by the way for tv okay. we have to take an entirely different approach right and because you write with Sean a lot, do you inevitably write dual um, POVs, or do you write, do you swap and change writing the same POV? Uh, well, we don't. So the way that Sean and I work together is um, we take turns. We're we're assembly line rather than parallel. So now Sean and Dave wrote um, a few stories. I know Yesterday's Gone was their first big project together. They had a smaller one, but this was their first big one, and they chose three characters each. And they each wrote three POVs, sort of parallel. Sean and I don't really work that way. The decision to have however many POVs is to some degree incidental to the writing process, because then when it's first draft time, I'm writing it from A to Z, whether there's one or 50 uh, points of view. You write the first draft? Yes. The whole first. I think I remember this from last time. Yeah. Yeah. You I mean, it's just... Every collaboration is different, and Sean is infinitely malleable. He'll work with whatever his collaboration partner is uh, is interested in. So we usually, usually Sean will either come up with the idea in whole, uh, I would say almost always, and he's giving me a package that includes, it's actually very similar to what you were referring to earlier. Yeah, yeah, that idea is where it came from, obviously. Uh, with the exception of uh, the plot, because in our particular case, we've learned that um, too much plotting too early on for us as a particular pair it just gets in the way. So usually we do a setup. We have a generally bones idea, like a, a pitch idea of sort of where it's going and w relevant world background and locations. And we, we still do casting usually, which means that we're choosing a Hollywood actor that we think would be good if this were a movie. And uh, then I take that package and I write it from start to finish in first draft and Sean and I meet along the way to sort of like course correct or, well, what do you think about this problem? How should we solve it? And then after I'm done, he takes over and does the editing passes. So, so you'll, you'll write it from beginning to end before Sean sees it. You don't discuss it with him during that drafting process? I do discuss it with him, yeah. So we've done it a few different ways. We've done ways where he tries to stay right behind me, sort of doing a first pass edit, maybe a week behind where I am sort of live. And then if we have meetings, I'll kind of catch up. Uh, you know, hey, here's what happened since you last read so that he's on the same page. Sometimes I have to um, more and more we started discussing holistically. So rather than I have this specific story problem that I need to solve, it's more like let's just talk about what's going on in the world, what might happen, big picture ideas, conceptual stuff. 
because it got so hard to get into the nitty gritty because Sean would be like, well, I don't really understand what you're talking about because I haven't read it yet. So um, it's a clumsy process that you'd think after 10 years we'd have it greased and we kind of do, but also kind of don't. We're always experimenting. So you live in Austin. Where does Sean live? Also in Austin, we oh, live about okay. a mile apart. Oh, great. I was going to say, because this, this helps, I think, when you're physically in the same same place. Yeah. And the third, um, Sean's... So so just for anybody who's following the Sterling and Stone saga, I am no longer Sean's business partner in the way that I used to be. So we used to co-run the business. And now it's Sean and um, Neve, who I don't think you've met. And Neve used to live in Ireland and literally about a week ago moved also to Austin. So yeah. all three of us are down here now. Wow. What's Dave's role in in the company? Similar to mine, but less, uh, even more distance, I would say. So uh, we've been using the term flagship author for me, which probably is just a way of making me feel better for being one of the uh, initial so people time, who are like, I'm a flagship. Title. Yeah, right, right. It sounds it sounds impressive. And I like those things. Um, and Dave is um, would also be one of, you know, the, he's, he's an author. So we're both authors, but I have my fingers, I would say, a, a tiny bit more in management when required, when requested. Um, but we're basi basically in the same place. We're, we're writers who have, let's say, a, a favored deal and position with our publishing company. Okay. I, you know, I've never met or spoken to Dave. I think he's avoiding me. We had one call together once and he disappeared after about five minutes. So he's obviously. Oh, well, to be fair, he, um, he avoids just about everybody and nobody yeah. knows whether he really exists. He's like a Bigfoot. Yeah, that's what Mark said. Don't take it personally. Um, <laughs> I will meet him one day uh, and I'll give him a big bear hug, which will make us both be weird. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about your writing process before we talk yes. about uh, the film. So uh, I I'm always fascinated. I know people who listen to the show are as well about how people, everyone approaches their writing. So you, during your first draft, what's your, first of all, what's your writing routine? What do you write on? When do you sit and write and how, how and where? Sure. Okay. So I write first thing in the morning. Um, somehow over the past few years, I've gotten lazier and lazier with waking up in the morning. So I used to get up at six and sometimes before. Now I typically wake up at seven and I have this weird window period between when I wake up and sit down at my desk and when uh, my kids go off to school, which I mean, they're 13 and 17. I don't need to be watching over them. But that said, when my son goes down to the bus, we usually walk with him because we take the dog on a loop. It's just a good cue to like take the dog on our morning uh, loop. And that window is this weird kind of like it's not long enough to really sink in. So sometimes I'll do like brainstorming, just kind of getting ready, getting organized during that time. And then when I come back, it's usually 815 ish. And I would write about from then until noon, 1230. And that's first draft writing time. Um, if I'm in the groove, that will be six or more thousand words sometimes it's less if the words come harder and then the afternoons i then take a midday break and um, work on a different kind of creative work in the afternoon so script work that sort of thing so th that writing session is that non-stop do you take breaks within that it's generally non-stop uh, just to run to the restroom or get a new cup of coffee or if the words are coming hard then i will find many ways to procrastinate but uh, it is intended to be a more or less nonstop period. Yes. Yeah, that's good. And how? What do you write on Scrivener or Word or? I use Scrivener. Yeah, I think that we're still kind of exploring, trying to find because we're highly collaborative. And Scrivener, I don't know if people have had this problem, but sometimes the Dropbox sync will be a little off, or there's just something that's a little off. It's really good, like it's really close to perfect. Um, and there are just a few little things that we wish it included. And uh, but we haven't found anything better. So we're sticking with Scrivener. And um, yes, so Scrivener is the short answer to that. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. good. OK, well, look, let's talk about it's Fat Vampire, isn't it? Which is the one that has been yes. picked up. Is that the expression being picked yes, up? It, it's uh, yeah, it's not just picked up. It's it's actually being shot, which it's funny because I, I look back and only in retrospect do I realize how incredibly fortunate I've been to have something that has gotten this far. So tell us about that. When did it first start? I think that we're probably coming up on three-ish years until from when I first had my contact. So uh, I received an email out of the blue from, it was somebody actually at, at the BBC, but I think he was more of a connection maker because it never, I don't think it ever really passed the BBC's desk. I think it was like he knew some people. And uh, through a series of phone calls sort of hooked us up with um, this company that did end up doing the production they're called modern story um 
I believe they're Canadian. I believe the company is Canadian. The, the two guys are not necessarily. Um, and uh, they optioned it and um, renewed that option a few times. And then we hit coronavirus and that slowed things down more. And then just about a year ago now, so we're recording this in March of 2022. So in March 2021, I got the word that it was officially greenlit for production. So at that point, things still could have fallen apart. Um, they could have decided not to actually do it, but that was when they said, okay, this is officially a green light. And by November, they um, had officially started principal photography. They'd done all the casting. They were getting people together to go up and shoot it. They shot it in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, or are shooting it, still going on. And uh, and that was when it was kind of real. You know, that was when wow. I actually went up and I watched it being filmed. And I said, okay, this is really happening. They're going to air it, you know, hopefully this year. Okay. So I have some questions. So the BBC guy, the fixer guy, as it turned out, where did he come across it? How did he know about it? He found it. So we've actually had inquiry on a few of our books. This is the only one that has has gone this far. But the the inquiry, inquiries we've gotten have come, uh, and I think this is important for your audience, have come through Apple, not from Amazon. And um, the feeling I've gotten is that the discovery on Amazon is a lot less common just because there's so much stuff. And that's where everybody put it's hard to sift through the noise, essentially. So I think that when when things really take off, they, uh, you know, people who are looking to adapt things do look there. But um, we've gotten the impression that uh, a lot of people consider Apple to be a more curated environment and they just came across it. Um, I just I think the title, you know, the title was Fat Vampire. And <clears throat> I think the guy might have been into something supernatural and he came across it and he said, well, I can't not look at that. It was intriguing. And he looked and then uh, and then sent us an email. So they. But everybody has found things through digitally, through um, through Apple Books. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, and in terms of the the company, who the production company. So if I get this right, often the people who buy an option, which is basically the right to make it uh, a contract between you, the right to make it, which will expire at some point. And you do get some money for that, so even if it doesn't get yes. made, we'll talk about that. If I get this right, that's not always the production company. That's very often. A, a production office and then and then they'll sell it into someone like HBO or, or yeah. whoever who make it so what what does that look like was this all the same company that's that's basically bought the option and is physically themselves making it no I'm still trying to figure out what producer means because producer means about 10 different things and yeah. there's about 10 different kinds of producers so the um the company that that optioned it originally again their name is modern story and the, the guys behind it are um jeremiah chechik and harley payton good and names. both of those i'm sorry good names yeah oh yeah totally and and they uh, it's funny because they're um shots of them in like you know the hollywood reporter or whatever they look like the same guy it's so funny they look like <laughs> right. it's, why is this guy in here twice um so they uh, they are the guys who I've had the most close connection throughout with the two of those guys. So those are the two. Jeremiah um, actually was directing the block that I saw when I went up there. And Harley is the executive producer, the, the showrunner. And um, but then but they acquired it and then sold it. They made a package and a show Bible and everything. And then they pitched it to various uh, companies. And it was NBC Universal that bought it and nbc universal um decided to put it on sci-fi which is one of their networks so the 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 money the the muscle you know the storytelling muscle whatever it is the crew getting everything together running the business of it i get the impression that the logistics are kind of like set up by by my guys by modern story and that it was i'm sorry all of the all of the equipment and all the, the that comes from NBC. And yeah. these guys are kind of like, okay, we have a property here that we have, we can gather talent together and develop it. Right. And how much, what was your involvement? Obviously you had the initial conversations and you mm -hmm. would have, you would have uh, agreed to a contract for the option at the beginning. And does yes. that, does, does the, does that option contract spell out what you'll get if it goes down the various stages? Um, yes, I had a very thorough option contract. I don't know if this is standard, but I did have an entertainment lawyer who did tell me that this is sort of the way that it's done is that the option says you have the option and it spells out the stipulations. You'll give me this much money of this much time. Here's what happens. But it also, if I'm remembering this right, and I'm pretty sure I am the, um, the, how much will you be paid? 
what will be the conditions of like ongoing relationships for other if they want to do other properties in the world that's all spelled out in that initial option contract so that it's just a matter of sort of advancing the proceedings to the next step rather than needing a new contract okay and uh, you don't have to share the actual figures it's probably confidential anyway but can you give us a, a ballpark in terms of your other earnings has this been an impactful and very well worth it session for you uh, you, you, well, yes. So it's been worth it in a few different ways. So basically there, and I, I don't think any of this violates confidentiality at all, because this is just sort of standard stuff. Usually you get paid in three different ways. So the first is the initial, the actual option payment, which is, um, it depends on who you are, but that's typically on the scale of say, uh, four figures, right? Like that's a thousands of dollars sort of thing. And, um, and, but it can be less. And I think that if you're established, it can be much more. Um, and then there's the rights purchase, which is the second way that you make money. And that's a much larger figure. And that is impactful. That did make a difference. And um, and then actually there are four ways. Then there's an episodic royalty that sometimes people get, which would just mean that however many episodes they're made. So it's a way of, you know, calibrating for future uh, things that are happening. And then the uh, the last way that, and I'm just giving you a general. I'm not giving you specifics about yeah, mine. Yeah. And Seems then in cool. general, the um, sometimes there's a percentage of like profits on the back end if you're lucky that they may give you a token of what the uh, the producers make. But yes, it has been a big deal in terms of the actual dollar figures. But even more important is that for us as a studio, we have multiple. Um, things that we're trying to pitch and pitching the first one, selling the first one is the hardest. So even if we made nothing on this first deal and it was a success and people knew about it, it would really be worth it to us because then the second one gets easier. Yeah, that's a world of difference, isn't there? Someone standing in your office before you who's got a successful show behind them or yes. one of the other billion people in the world who just want to do that and haven't done it yet. Yeah, yeah. And, and, that's, and that's a lot of people. So it cuts through, yeah. cuts you to the front of the line. Yeah, that's really good. And here's something I was thinking of. I'm ready for when that BBC guy phones me about my novels. And uh, uh, this is what I want in my contract because I self-publish. Obviously, you publish through Sterling and Stone. I want the I want to have permission to use their artwork and graphics and branding they come up with for their show on my front covers, which you do see trad publishing doing all the time. Mm -hmm. So. You know, Hunt for Red October was out for a few years before it got made into a film. And of course, there's now a major film tie-in cover with Sean Connery on the front or whoever, mm -hmm. uh, Alec Baldwin. That's, that seems to me something as a self-published author you might forget to ask for, um, but could be incredibly useful to you. Is that something you can use? Can you repackage your book now using whatever branding they're coming up with and the pictures of the actors and so on? Well, we're, we're stepping into territory where I don't know what I'm allowed to say. I do know that we asked for that. Um, I don't know the answer, and I don't know if I could tell you if I, they did answer, and or I'd have to kill you, one of the two, yes. right? Okay, um, I appreciate that. But but that is something that we considered, especially, and I, it's so funny because I I actually feel weirdly bad about this, even though it's nothing that I did wrong. But there's another book called Fat Vampire, and like I feel the need to differentiate. I mean, I I feel like that dude probably feels like I stole his idea. I swear I did not. I swear it's just a coincidence. But the need to have a cover that differentiates from the incorrect story does feel um does feel important so i know that we're asking for that i don't know if we've gotten it or gonna get it yeah okay surely you can say now a nbc series on the top yeah and we do we, we, we've we've yeah. definitely done that and i think that we're entering the phase where publicity is gonna is gonna start yeah um, because they've been really soft like only until recently they hadn't decided on the name for the show because it's not it's not gonna be fat vampire unfortunately i wish it uh, was but it's not mm. um in other countries, maybe it will be, but but not not on Sci-Fi. Have they announced its name? They they have, and I don't think it hurts anybody to tell tell you all that I do not like this name. But whatever they're going to do, what they're going to do, it's called Reginald the Vampire. Which, Reginald the Vampire. Which you know, I, I quite like that. No, it's a, I, I kind of hate it. Do you? It's a kind of Shaun of the Dead type name. Maybe it'll catch on because you're you're absolutely right. You're the first person who said that. But I really like Shaun of the Dead. But Shaun of the Dead does play off of Dawn of the Dead. And Reginald yeah. the Vampire just sounds like here's what this show is about. It's a guy named Reginald who's a vampire. So yeah. m many people have assured me that even though Fat Vampire is this really catchy title that doesn't automatically make people like go, I want to know more, that the title doesn't matter nearly as much 
today as it might have in the past, especially with some star power behind it. And, yeah, you know, the Jacob Batalon who plays the lead, his star is on the rise. And so right. I think that we can ride a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that that's a really interesting thing. So they've come up with a new title. So if I again, if I was publishing my book and they came up with a new title for it, I would want to republish my book with that title to tie in. I wonder if you could do that. I mean, I know that I'm going to get a a title card. I've started paying attention to these sorts of things. And, you know, if you watch a show that based on the book by is usually right before like directed by it might be the final thing or right the showrunner. And so prominently based on the Fat Vampire book series by Johnny B. Truon is probably worth a lot. Yeah. And it does say Fat Vampire. It's going to be on every single episode okay. by itself. Okay. So my hope is that that and plus it is still a really catchy title for the book. Yes. But, uh, yeah, but yeah, is, that's, yeah, yeah, that's what they're going for. Well, tell us about the story, Johnny. Where did the story come from? And uh, is this something this is because you did this. We talked about your collaboration with Sean, but this was mm-hmm. a solo project, right? This was solo and it was I had my uh, my my initial book, which was the you know, everyone says your first book is kind of clearing your throat and putting all your neuroses into the book and every idea you had. And so in that way, it's this it's this perfect little time capsule that whether it's good or whether it's bad, it's its own thing and it needs to be on its own shelf in a weird way. So past that, Fat Vampire was the first book that I wrote. So literally the second felt like the first. And um, that was 2012. And the story was it was actually started out of it on a joke that on our old podcast called Better Off Undead. And um, it was one of the first few episodes. It's still out there somewhere. And that show started as, in theory, a horror podcast because our thought was that we would talk about horror topics and then people who liked horror might want to read our books. It lasted that way about 10 episodes. And then we just started making fun of Dave all the time. And that became the show center. And so in those first episodes, one of the prompts was something about, you know, what kind of a supernatural monster would you be or something? And Dave made a joke about how Dave's a big guy. And so he made a joke about how if he was ever turned into a vampire that he he's like, well, I wouldn't be able to catch anybody to feed on him. You know, he just went into his all his stereotypes. And so um, I thought I wanted to write that book about an underdog, just sort of an average Joe who gets turned into a vampire accidentally. It's that his maker changes him to save his life. And um, he then has to contend with a world of like Twilight style, fancy vampires who are just, you know, immaculately dressed and beautiful and thin and perfect all the time. Because I thought it'd be really funny to have this misfit who didn't work in this world, but he has his own powers that it's kind of a um, beauty is more than skin deep sort of a thing. So Reginald on the top level doesn't fit in with the vampire society at all. And so they don't like him and they're trying to like get rid of him as like this quote unquote inferior representative of their race. But then he has all these powers that they don't have because, you know, he's he's had to delve deeper in his vampirism, essentially. So it's an underdog story. Yeah, uh, sounds hilarious. That's a really good concept. Mm-hmm. Um and there is something about, you know, that all the superhero fantasy comes back often to us thinking about ourselves, why urban fantasy does so well, isn't it? And the idea of being Spider-Man and being able to take out your enemies. So I think the closer you align it to some of the issues that we face every day, uh, which, uh, you know, for some people is is being surrounded by the young and beautiful and not being able to do stuff. That's great. Good, great mm-hmm. concept. Um, so one book, was it one book? No, I was originally one, but then people wanted a sequel. And so I actually wrote six. And then I started a side series about. Um, so Reginald is the main vampire in the fat vampire series, but his maker is named Maurice. And so I started a spin off series with Maurice, like because he's 2000 years old in my version. And so he it's like his, you know, through time where he's his adventures, basically. Okay. So, yeah. And, and I think there are three of those three or four right now. So when did you write this, Johnny? Um, over time, the first one was written in 2012, and I think I had the original six finished maybe early 2014. I don't remember. And then the I call it the Vampire Maurice series, which is a play off of like the Vampire Lestat. And so th- that I think we started, um, I started three years ago, something like that. But I'm going to close that one soon. Although since I haven't closed it, watch the show take off and they'll be like, wait, I don't want to close that. I could keep writing those yeah. books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this has been published and out there all that time. Yeah, and I think that that's one the one tip that I can give to people because I've I have talked about this on a few um, interviews so far 
is just time, time and exposure. So that book has it's I mean, it's been 10 years now. It's had a whole bunch of like book bubs and just other advertisements. And so it has its tendrils out there into the world in ways that we as authors don't have any visibility to. We just know that, you know, 100,000 people downloaded it on BookBub Day or something like that. And you don't know where those go. You don't know if people open them. But we have had, um, I've run across all the time people saying, oh yeah, I've I read that book. Or there was one meeting that Sean and Neve took with a producer um, about a totally different project. They're meeting with producers all the time. And Sean mentioned that, you know, we work with Johnny B. True and who, you know, and, and the guy turned around and on the bookcase behind him said, you mean this guy? And he had a, a hardback, not a hardback, but a paperback of Fat Vampire. You just never know. You know, those books are out there somewhere and people are reading them. Yeah. So I think you've been up and visited the set. Yes. Uh, that was just a few weeks ago, actually. It was in Victoria, B.C. And what was that like standing in a set, looking at all that equipment, all those people, all that money based on something you just, you just sat and wrote? It's exactly the way that you described. Yeah. So um, when we originally had the option, it kind of glanced off me like, OK, well, that's interesting. Then when the rights were purchased, then when I got paid, like you'd think these were are things that would have really been making it click for me, you know, hearing the cast announced. But none of it really clicked until I got on set. And I saw that there's like 200 people or so, and not just on set, but in offices, in the legal department, the art department, that their full time job right now is based around this story that I sat down in my office one day and told, you know, I'm talking to actors who are trying to figure their their motivation and everything for like characters that I created. It was it was really, really amazing and humbling, honestly, to see, you know, millions of dollars of work and all of those people out there um, doing something that revolved around my ridiculous story. Yeah, what a great moment, though. And what do you say to an actor who asks you? I mean, do you do you have a lot of thoughts about your characters, even the side characters? Or are you happy to let them interpret things and be interested to see which, which way they go? It's entirely their show. Yeah. So um, you actually asked me earlier how involved I was with everything. And the um, the Harley, they both, Harley and Jeremiah have both been incredibly inclusive, but they don't have to include me at all. Like they don't, they don't have to ask my opinion on anything. They don't. And, and they, to be fair, they've, they've asked for like, um, like I, you know, I sat in on the writer's room and popcorn and they were very gracious and accepting me to in there. But, but in no way did my opinions weigh more than anyone else's. Um, and and so what was your original question? Because I detoured to answer. Yeah, I was just wondering what you say to actors, whether you, you feel oh, quite yeah, yeah, strongly yeah. that, well, you know, this is what I think the characters. Yeah, no, it's of. it's their interpretation. So the the um, uh, that's the reason I made the point about being in the writer's room and stuff is they were making decisions. There's a bunch of stuff that isn't even in my books, um, characters that aren't in my books, scenes, settings, all this stuff. And it's the same with the actors. Um, if anyone wanted my opinion, I would, of course, give it. But um, anything that they're doing, see, that's the thing. I think that a lot of people don't understand how incredibly collaborative TV and film is and has to be mm. because, you know, you when you write a book, it's it's a it's a direct line between your brain and the reader's brain. And you get to dictate everything other than their interpretation of it. But with TV and film, the the producers are relying on the director to have a really good vision. The director is relying on the director of photography to frame shots in a really good way and the audio technicians to, you know, handle all that. And the DP is relying on the, the gaffer and the lighting guys. And so it, it's like, it's more like the, the, from the top, you're coordinating an effort rather than creating an effort yourself. And so when I talk to the actors, you know, however they feel that they want to interpret these characters, that's great with me. You know, I, I trust them and you know entirely and and same with the writer same with the director i trust them to do their jobs yeah and something i noticed about american television we've often had this thing about in the uk you know a series would typically have six episodes per series and then maybe after two series i think well we've probably explored it now and uh, american series seem to go on for about 25 episodes but one of the differences is you'll see the same producer director writer on every episode in the uk mm -hmm. whereas in america you have this character called the showrunner but underneath that you get a different team i used the word block earlier so i think because a friend of mine works mm -hmm. on the crown here in the uk and she talks about blocks so you have a, a team who work on blocks and so it's compartmentalized which means i guess it's only the showrunner 
who has that overall continuity is able mm-hmm. to bring that to the whole series. Um, otherwise, you've just got different directors bringing their own thing to it. Yeah, actually. So in features, the director has the vision and is responsible for communicating the vision. Now, I'm speaking out my ass a little bit here, like I, but I think that I'm right about this. But at least in my experience, what I've seen and what I understand is that in TV, it's not that way. In TV, the vision is the showrunner and the directors are doing the best to interpret they're, they're one tier below. So the director is essentially reporting to the showrunner's larger vision. So here's the vision I want. And then the director says, okay, within those confines, here's how I'm going to put this together. But they're using the same crew. So the director of photography is going to shoot everything about the same way. And one of the showrunner's jobs is to take the individual scripts. So the, you didn't actually ask this, but the implied question, there are 10 episodes. And right. And I don't know how many directors they have, but it's not one. No. And so the um, but it was 10 individual writers working with the writer's room, but 10 individual writers who wrote those scripts. And so the showrunner has to kind of homogenize them and make sure yeah. go through, make all the continuity is OK, but also the tone, you know, the feel so that you don't have this like Kafka esque episode being followed by some Chris Columbus, bright and sunny thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I'm slightly obsessed with Seinfeld and Curb, and I read a lot about the history of those shows. And I remember reading, one of the writers wrote an autobiography, actually, but he had an interview that they've got like four episodes on the go at any one time. And there's Mm. only really three or four people in the middle in those cases, like Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld, who have that continuity and the ones who say straight away, no, 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 this is not going to fit in. But uh, Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very different way from in Britain where he just gets one team I, I, it is probably now changing in the UK because we always follow best practice for America. But uh, anyway, that's yeah. that interests me. Um, mm-hmm. Very different, you know. As you say, so uh, book writing is a solo thing, and we worry a bit about writers becoming a bit lonely or going a bit stir crazy. And yet, exactly the opposite happens. But the essence of what you're doing is the same. It's storytelling. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's it, I think it's worth saying that um, maybe this crew, I actually was told that this production is kind of a unicorn, that it was it had a different feel than than most productions. This is by people on the set. But that said, they were very, very welcoming. Right. I mean, it was it was actually super cool to be the author on set. I was I was kind of a minor celebrity on set. It was it was kind of amazing. Quite rightly. And nobody knows who you are because, you know, unlike the stars, you don't usually have a recognizable face. So there's usually this moment where you kind of get to know them. And then and then somebody says something and their face changes like, oh, you wrote the books that we're all working on, essentially. Very cool moments. Yeah, very good indeed. Okay, so what is the knockoff of this experience? You you are focusing a little bit more on potential um, adaptations. Well, the books are always going to come first. So that's actually beautiful. Um, Hollywood likes to direct, uh, likes to work with things with existing IP. So the fact that there is a book, you know, I get to focus on books first, in other words, because there's a there's a chance where I could see a world where, okay, well, let's shift entirely and we're done with books and let's just work on scripts. And that's just not the way it is. So and, and, you know, you kind of asked this earlier, too. it, It really hasn't changed the way that I work, I mean, maybe I guess it's in my head a little bit sometimes. So for instance, one of the works that we're looking to adapt right now has a lot, it's, it's kind of a mind bender. And so there's a lot that happens inside the main character's head and he's by himself a lot. And that adaptation has required reimagining some stuff because in a film, you can't just have one guy walking around thinking like that would be the worst film ever. So we have to change things to fit the tools. And I think that that sort of thing, I'm maybe a little more subconsciously mindful of at this point, like, okay, this is a real introspective sort of a section and this is eventually going to be a film. So that will be difficult, but in general, it hasn't really changed a whole lot in general. We've just continued to write the stories we want to write and maybe with a little extra attention before it's written choice of story rather than method of writing the story. Mm. But even then we're not, we're not, only looking at the ones that can be adapted. We're, we're, we're minding our roots, you know? Well, this may be never be adapted, but we want to tell this story, so we're going to tell it anyway. Okay, but you are, are you doing some screenplays then as well? I'm trying to learn it. It's very hard. Um, 
it's just it's such a different style but that's something that i'm learning so i think if you ask me a year from now yes i am okay. um, right now the answer is i am trying and the yeah. company as a whole is um it's just that it's new to me yeah right so what's next for uh, sterling and stone are you going to do another summit uh, you, no, we're, 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 we're done with those. They, they were really, really fun to attend. They were not so fun to organize and put on, and they were, we never really made any money on them. They were always a big risk. Um, I did really enjoy them, and one of the things I miss is b- being um, a public a little bit. Uh, you know, we don't have our self-publishing podcast anymore either, so that ins- entire wing is gone. Um but I mean, I think it's just continuing to, to to work, to adapt. Sean and Neve are meeting with a lot of production companies. They've met with, I don't know, 30 to 50 different production companies and have various things in stage, you know, which are being read and that sort of thing. So we're continuing to push in that direction because in our experience, and I don't know about yours or, or, um, or, or Mark's or anybody in the audience, but we're finding that indie publishing is becoming a little bit more it's it's a harder boulder to push because it's almost like pay to play you have to pay as much in advertising sometimes as you're getting out the back end and what's what this lets us do is if we can get something that's adapted not only is that um we call that the you know the million dollar customer instead of the two dollar customer that sort of thing and the $2 customer is still our foundation. Like I still want to be a novelist whose books are known, but we have that. And then that not only gives us a big paycheck, which allows us to keep moving forward, but it also is a new source of advertising that we don't have to pay for. When they start pushing Reginald the Vampire based on Fat Vampire, um, you know, there will be press to be done. I've made it clear that if they ever want me, I'm there. And the more people who know about this, because... I mean, again, like I just keep seeing more and more Jacob Battle on and that, you know, he's got his fans. And so people are going to come looking for Fat Vampire. We're not going to have to advertise that. And so it gives us this this new funnel into books. So we're able to make more from the books because we've gotten something adapted from the books, basically. Yeah, that would be great, wouldn't it? If Jacob hits, uh, he gets into Maverick 3, Top Gun, the sequel, which we haven't had the, se- the actual sequel yet, but uh when he hits his big movie, people, the kids just going to be going back, back catalog, aren't they? Yeah. Well, and they keep using him more and more in Spider-Man. I mean, I saw No Way Home and he's got a bigger role. And I swear, I swear they're going to do something else with him. It looks like they're seeding more Ned superhero. So we'll have to see. But, you know, I mean, I think they would be smart to keep making Fat Vampire while he's on the rise. Yeah, definitely. Uh, when is it out and where can people see it? Well, it'll be on sci-fi. Um, I know some of the the details of potential distribution. I don't think I'm supposed to talk about them, but I do know that it will eventually percolate from sci-fi onto other platforms. Um, but originally sci-fi um, and uh, this year sometime, um, okay. probably summer. And that's going to be really cool. I'm trying to talk him into, hey, can we do some sort of like Austin premiere? Like, I feel like I want to have some sort of a premiere. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I always wanted to make it to a summit, but I unfortunately couldn't. So if you have a premiere... Uh, in Austin, I'll come to that if you'll invite. If I'm invited, or even if I'm not, I'm just going to stand the other side of the street. Well, I, yeah, I don't, there you go, there you go. I'll <laughs> let you know when I when I know something. I'm, okay. I'm trying to walk that line between what can I do and am I too annoying? Uh, it sounds like you're you're a VIP on the set, so I think you've walked that line absolutely well. <laughs> I'm um, trying it, Johnny. It's been really great to catch up. Time has flown by. Thank you so much. Look, give our give our love and regards to Sean and Dave, and um, I can't wait to uh, have a beer with you again in person at some point. Yeah, likewise. Um, I I don't know how often our paths are going to cross if we're not doing summits, but man, I would love that opportunity. We'll find a way. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate. it. Always love doing it. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. I told you a little tease there. So Johnny, Johnny's theory is that books on Apple have better visibility in Hollywood for some reason. And he's got some anecdotal evidence of a couple of people who've had options and things picked up that their books have been seen on Apple. He's not really sure why. Um, but anyway, uh, so if that's if it's important to you, uh, you it's a bit of a long shot and a bit, bit of a compromise if if uh, exclusive is your strategy, but it's something to think about. Always good to talk to Johnny B. Truant and the boys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've never met them before, actually. I mean, I've been on the podcast and we've done bits and bobs like that, but I've never actually met them. I know you Have do. you not? No, no. I Were didn't you not in Nick that time? 
I didn't oh, okay. go at that time. No. So yes, you've you've met them. I I haven't, but yeah. I mean, I'm, I think I've got a lot of respect for what they did in the early days. There weren't there were three podcasts really. I think I've probably mentioned this before. Joanna Penn, who you know, friend of the show. Um, Sean, Johnny, Johnny, and Dave, and Rocking Self Publishing with Simon Whistler. He was yeah. one of the the um, in terms of the English interviewer. You've taken up his mantle um, and 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 run with it further than he managed in terms of. I think he had about 150 episodes. We've uh, well, we 350 now. So, I, 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 hmm. I so yes, yeah. so those were the three I listened to when I got started. Uh, all of those, um, and so it's it's. I did wonder, you know, I've wondered what they've been doing because they they've Johnny, Sean, and Jeff, Dave don't do the podcast anymore. Um, and I think they're talking about maybe doing another one, but they, yeah, they, they, they were certainly important when I, I got started. So I'm pleased to see that they're doing well. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they're, they're great guys and they were quite formative for me because those early days when I was trying to tune into this environment, that was the podcast I listened to. Mm. And by the way, they invented banter at the beginning of the podcast. Yes, they, they did, were. Yeah. Their, their banter section was about half an hour yes. and it was usually very funny. So, uh, yeah, we follow in their footsteps. Um, good. Right. Well, I've got an entire Word document to go through and change mm. Zs into Zs or Ss, in fact. Yes, exactly. And add, add some Us to colour. I'll tell you yes. what I did do during the book. I very often reworded, reworked a sentence to not include a word that had oh, your spelling. So there won't be that many examples of it Yeah, um, to get around that. Good. Uh, I think that's it. It's snowing here. It's been snowing all day. It's really weird. Yeah, I've not had that. It's cold here, but um, my mum said it was snowing. She's in kind of in your area. Actually, we're heading in your area on Saturday. Um, so we'll be having a week in the the coast coastal house. So um, Oh, yeah. that would be great. Yes. Mm. And... Um, I think I must take you up on your offer to go to that coastal house at some point. Does it accept yes, dogs? It does, doesn't yeah. accept dogs. Well, yeah, it accepts it our dog. Oh, does it? Okay, because yeah, yeah. that's that's made for dogs. That part. Of the oh world. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, Scout's very excited. Superb. Okay, look, thank you very much indeed to Johnny B. Truant. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to our team in the background who make this podcast possible. Uh, don't forget, you can go to patreon.com to help the podcast and also get some goodies at patreon.com forward slash self publishing show. That is it for us. All that remains for me to say is it's goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.